I love to hear everybody come in and just share together. I love to hear everybody pray together, talk together, have something to eat together, and be able to spend up time praising God and opening His Word, because He always has a message for us, and there's no doubt about that. And I just want you, when to come in the door, one of the things I pray for every day is when we come through the door, we breathe out the world. The world's becoming more complex and more discouraging in so many different ways. And we breathe in the Lord. We hear from so many different voices, sometimes from our own head, that don't do us any favors at all. We need to hear more from God. Because He speaks to us about things that are good, pure, and holy. So today we're going to be on a passage that most people, have, at least some of the verses, that are very familiar with. But sometimes they're misquoted. Sometimes people look at them in ways that aren't what they're actually saying. So how do you present new truth when people think they've got certain things figured out where they minimize some of the things that are so important? Well, the Lord said to me, here's what I want you to do this day. So I want you to jab a little bit. Have a little fun today. Have a little fun today. And then after everybody's left a little bit, then um, come out punch. Come out punch. <laughs> but before I punch you, I've been punching myself all week long. You're not right, brother. You step on somebody else's toes, you've been stepping on your own toes all week long. And it stays with you. And then all the way home, you think about it. I wonder if I did that right. About a million times. So today, let's go to Lord in prayer. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4, just where we left off last week. Philippians chapter 4. We're only going to take on three verses because this is a deep passage. And I want us to go deep more than I want us to go wide, that's for sure. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are a great God. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that your goodness is coming after us. Father, you warned us, Lord, that in this world we will have trials and tribulations, but you didn't put a period there. You said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you walk with us when we go through difficult times. And you are stronger. And Father, we know that you can overcome not just the things that are in this world, but you can overcome the things that are in our worlds. Sometimes we're overwhelmed. Sometimes we misstep. Sometimes we misspeak. Sometimes we lose opportunities that could have brought so much good, and we don't bring good. In fact, we contribute to something that aren't even good at all. But Father, we thank you, Lord, that when we come to you, Lord, we can walk in newness of life and our chains can be broken. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us freedom. And I thank you, Lord, that you've reminded us in your word that we're citizens of heaven even before we get there. Father, I pray now we just would make a choice to open up our hearts as we open your word. And I pray, Lord, that we would see what the words actually say. And we ruminate on them. We pray. We wouldn't just think about how they apply to everybody else, but we'd spend some time speaking about how they apply to us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your words are faithful and your words are true. And we pray, Lord, that today your spirit would just help us understand what we need to know. Convict us where necessary. Strengthen us where we're weak. And help us to want to walk a deeper path with you. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, where do you begin when you're talking about a truth that most people feel like they know, but maybe they don't know it quite as much as what they think? Where do you begin when people feel like, hmm, I say amen to that, or maybe they say a little bit more oh me to that than what they say amen? How do you begin to share some truth that's sometimes not easy to take? Well, let me tell you, whether we like it or not, one of the things that I know, especially as I'm heading towards another birthday, is that all of us are getting older. All of us are getting older. Now, we can ignore that, we can try to deny that, but it is a fact of life. It's been said that you know you're getting older when you are on the, your knees buckle, but your belt won't. <laughs> that there's some truth in it. It's said you know you're getting a little older when you have more hair growing on your ear than you do on your head. I don't know why everybody's talking about me, but I know that's a truth for me. Although I do say this, you know, you don't put marble tops on cheap furniture. <laughs> You know you're growing older when you try to straighten out the wrinkles that are in your socks, and then you find out you don't have socks on. That's a <laughs> You know you're getting older when you and your teeth don't sleep in the same area. You know you're getting older when your back goes out, but you stay home. 
You know, you're getting older when you wake up and you look at your picture in the mirror, and when you see a picture in the mirror, it's just like the one on your driver's license. You know you're getting older when you say, oh, I'm going to go out, and when you go out, the only place you go is to your patio. You know you're getting older when you say, I'm going to do some weightlifting, the only weightlifting that you do is when you stand up. You know you're getting older when you look around. This happened to me the other day with a pen rather than with my glasses. I was said to Amy, I just can't find my pen. I can't find my pen. Amy said, it's on your vest. But more often than not, because I have different kinds of vision struggles, sometimes to take my glasses up, sometimes I have to take my glasses down. You know you're getting older when you're looking and looking and looking through glasses and you know where they are on the top of your head. You know you're getting older when you have to bend down. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. And while you're down there, you think, what else could I do when I'm here? Because I'm looking back here again. <laughs> you know that you're getting older when you find yourself talking about gasoline and the price of gasoline all the time. And every time I get out, I think, oh, it went up three more cents. I can remember when it was quarter and all those things. I remember coming down here when I was a boy. And I'd, I'd be able to get a gallon of gas and buy a back of baseball cards off for 25 or 30 cents. You know, you're getting older. You know you're getting older when you have a party at your house and nobody even realizes that you're doing it. You know you're getting older when all of your dreams are reruns. You know you're getting older when you wonder how you could possibly be over the hill when you don't even remember being on top of the hill. You know you're getting older when you feel like you've got so many more interests than you ever had before, but nobody ever asks you any questions. Now don't let those statements discourage you. After all, just because you're getting older does not mean that you are worthless. Now think about that for a little while. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean that you're worthless. Remember, someone once said these words, old folks are worth a fortune. There's silver in their hair. There's gold in their teeth. There's stones in their kidneys. There's lead in their feet. And there's gas in their stomachs. I wasn't sure that you said that in the And then they continue. But continue by saying these words, I've become a little bit older since I've seen you last, and a few changes have come into my life. Frankly, I've become a little bit of a frivolous gal. I'm seeing five gentlemen every day. As soon as I wake up, I get a hold of willpower, and he helps me get out of bed. Then I go see John. Then Charlie Horse comes along, and when he leaves here, he spends some time with me and takes a lot of my attention. When he leaves, Arthur Wrightus comes into the room, and he shows me, shows me a lot of help for the rest of the day, but he takes me from one place to another, going from joint to joint. And after a really busy day, I spend a little bit of time with Asper Cream, and I'm so very really grateful for that. The preacher came to me the other day, and he said, you should, at your age, starting to think more and more and more about the hereafter. And I told you, oh, I do that all the time. No matter where I am, whether I'm in the parlor upstairs, in the kitchen, or down in the basement, I ask myself, what am I here after? <laughs> I laugh at those things, and I think it's good to laugh about those things, but here's something else. I can relate to them. Yeah. And as the years pass, well, let me be more specific. As the months pass, let me be even more specific. As the weeks pass, as the days pass, sometimes even as the hours pass, I can find myself relating to them all the more. Now, why did I share that with you? I love that when you left, but I share it with you to remind you of a really important truth, a biblical truth. Life is short. Mm -hmm. Even if you live to 100, mm -hmm. life is short. That's exactly what Bob says. It's like a shadow. It comes for a while and then passes away. It's like a mist. It's like a puff of smoke. Scripture speaks about it over and over again, telling us that life is short. Please know this. Not only is the life of other people short, our lives are short too. And the years have taught me something. Maybe it's more appropriate and more um, effective and maybe it's more um, rightly stated. The years are teaching me a really important truth, and I hope that they always do. My biggest battle is not against aging, although at times that's quite a battle. My biggest battle is against maturity. Maturity. My biggest battle is against maturity. No one has a choice about whether they're growing older or not. Age is a matter of life, but maturity, especially spiritual maturity, is a matter of choice. You hear that again? 
Spiritual maturity is a matter of choice. Your choice, my choice. You see, it's not how long we've known the Lord that makes us spiritually mature. It's how much we have chosen, and it's a choice, to grow in Him. Some folks have known the Lord for 30 years, and you think that they would be a seasoned 30-year Christian, but when you really look at them, and even when they look at themselves, what do they see? They see that they're a one-year Christian 30 times over. That being sure it is, what is spiritual maturity? What is spiritual maturity? What does it look like? Is spiritual maturity just saying, I have a whole lot of Bibles in my house. I have more Bibles in my house, and I have more hymn books in my house, and anybody else I know. Is that what spiritual maturity is? No, those are not really what it's about. Is spiritual maturity with somebody that just can pray, and pray and pray and pray for a really long time, and pray very passionately? Is that what spiritual maturity is? Well, not necessarily. Is spiritual maturity somebody who just is so in fact when they're worshiping that they're jumping up and down, they're clapping in their spirits? Is that spiritual maturity? Well, not necessarily. Is spiritually maturity saying things very emphatically and making declarations for all to hear about what you believe and so on and so on and so on? What is spiritual maturity and what does it look like? You know what? When you've got a question like that, and that's a Bible question. The Bible gives you the answer, and I want you to see it's right where we left off. Look at me in Philippians chapter 4. Verses 10 through 13, because we're going to see the answers to this very important question, what is spiritual maturity? Let's go verse by verse. Look at verse 10. Paul is writing, he says these words, I rejoice. I didn't just say I rejoice, I said I rejoice greatly. How? In the Lord. I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that unless you have renewed your concern for me, indeed you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, before we talk about these words, let's remember what's going on because you have to be following the context of the Bible to be able to get out of it, what you really need to get out of it. It's important to remember, where is Paul when he's writing this letter? He's under house arrest, and he's been under house arrest for a really long time. What else do we know? We know that he's been chained to a guard. What else do we know? We know he's awaiting trial and he's facing a very uncertain future. We can be sure, as he's under house arrest with this guard right next to him, that he had very little of any privacy or freedom. He had very little contact with probably almost everybody, but especially the people in Philippi. Yet, instead of feeling sorry for himself, what did he do? He made the choice to continue to preach and write about the very thing, and live about the very things he's been talking about. What does he say when he's talking about this difficult time in his life? He said, I not only rejoice, but I greatly rejoice. So how do you know you're greatly rejoicing? You're greatly rejoicing when you rejoice in the Lord. And then he shows that he really believes that because he says to the people in Philippi, I am very grateful for you. He was not, indi he was not indicting them with his words, much less in his mind, much less in his heart, when he wrote, at last, you've renewed your concern for me. He wasn't saying, where have you been? He wasn't saying, how come I haven't heard from you? Instead of thinking the worst about people, what did he do? He thought the best about people, saying, in essence, these words, I thank the Lord for your concern for my welfare. He deeply appreciated their friendship they shared and the support they had provided. Now, I know what you know. Sometimes absence makes the heart grow fonder. But sometimes absence encourages people to forget if not forget altogether. We don't know why the Philippians hadn't had the opportunity to show its concern and support for Paul, but this much we do know, it didn't create doubt or uncertainty in him at all. Have you seen what I do in this particular passage of Scripture? Instead of being reactive or jumping to conclusions, he affirmed those he knew and loved, saying in essence these words, even when I didn't hear from you, I knew you were still concerned for me. I'm grateful for your support and even more for the heart behind it. This is an example of spiritual maturity and what it looks like. Paul was what? Paul was stable. Paul was balanced. He wasn't up one minute and down the next minute. He wasn't in one moment and then out the next moment. Some people might say, well, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute. Slow down a little bit. If Paul was in such a good place, why did he even write those words, at last you have renewed your concern for me? Why did he mention it at all? Well, I'll tell you why. He brought it up to share another example of a spiritual truth. We do well to know, remember, and practice. What is it? 
Look at verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned, very important word, if you underline your Bible, I encourage you to underline that. I have learned what? I have learned to be content. Great word. I have learned to be content. Look how he continues. Whatever the circumstances, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now let's not move too quickly. Let's make sure we understand what we're talking about. Let's make sure we're understanding what the Bible's teaching. So what does spiritual maturity look like? It looks like someone who is stable. It looks like someone who is balanced. It looks like someone who is not in and out and up and down, but consistently living it out. That is what spiritual maturity looks like. Verse 11 tells us it's learning to be content regardless of the circumstance. That's a hard truth to accept. It's a hard truth to affirm. It's a hard truth to live out. But we need to recognize that we need to walk that way if we really want to become a spiritually mature Christian. Now in verse 12, Paul is led of the Spirit to expound or build on what he shared in verse 11. Look at it with me. He said, I know. I know what? The how he continues. Where does there be a need? And I know where there's that plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. What's Paul saying? He's saying, I have learned. And just come to him automatically. I have learned what? I've learned through personal experiences to be content. Whether I'm in need or whether I have plenty, whether I'm free or whether I'm bound, whether I'm hot, whether I'm cold, whether the people that flip by send me a gift or whether I fail to have contact from them. And the word need there is a very special word in the Bible. If you get a biblical dictionary, you look up the word need and you see what it actually means in this particular verse. Let me tell you how it's translated. It means to be made low. We hear that again? To be made low. That's a significant thing to recognize. In other words, what's Paul saying when he writes these words? He says, I know what it means to be hungry. He's saying, I know what it means not to have proper clothing. I know what it means to be looked down upon by other people. I know what it means to have low status. I know what it means to have no respect. I know what it means to have no recognition, much less appreciation from anybody. Now think with me about his trip. Think with me about the life that he lived. Give it a phenomenological viewpoint. Look at across the course of his life. The scripture tells us that he was frequently imprisoned. The scripture tells us he had a lot of close encounters with death. The Bible tells us on five occasions he was whipped 39 times. Three times he was beaten with rods. Paul was stoned. He was three times shipwrecked. And one of those experiences he spent the day and the night in the midst of the sea. There were plenty of times in his life where he felt weariness and sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, fasting, cold, and nakedness. Yet instead of letting those things distract him or defeat him, what did he make the decision to do? What was the choice that he made? He learned to be what? He learned to be content. Now look at the other end of the continuum. He also said, I know what it means to have a lot. Think about some of the blessings this guy had. After he met with Jesus, what happened? He met with Jesus again, one-on-one, -on -one, in Arabia. And the Lord himself tutored him. What a blessing that would be. Every letter he wrote, almost every letter he wrote, he talked about people who he loved and he acknowledged them and he greeted them. Many friends he had that were so near and dear to his heart. And he had special people in his life. He had a man by the name of Barnabas, the son of encourager, who built to him to his life. When people gave him a hard time, Barnabas would go and would lead the way and would make people look at him with different eyes. Paul was greatly used of God to do a lot of wonderful things. He was able to start churches. He was able to continue to visit, encourage, and instruct people. He was able to continue to write letters and the epistles. He also witnessed and experienced miracles being performed. Yes, the Apostle Paul experienced life on both ends of the continuum. And it wouldn't be an easy thing to face the challenges he faced. And it would be more than a little tempting to get caught up in the things of this world. It would be more than a little tempting for him to get caught up with status and notoriety, position, and pride. Yet what did Paul choose? He chose to learn to be content whatever the circumstances. Now let's talk. Because being content is not something you're going to hear out there. And you're not always going to hear it in here, and you're not always going to hear it in here. 
fear or in your brain or in your desire. Contentment does not come naturally. You hear that again? Contentment does not come naturally. No one is born contented. I love babies. Not the best of holding babies because I didn't grow up with too many babies in my world. Not the best of holding babies, but I love babies. But are babies contented? No. They're crying all the time and they have needs all the time. I love children. I love spending time walking around to try to make sure all the children get candy before they leave. No, I don't work for a dentist. I just want them to know that they're loved. Okay? I love children. But children, what starts to happen to children? Does anyone ever have to teach them the word no? No, it seems innate, right? It just seems innate. They say no, no, no. When you say yes, yes, yes. And then when they get older, what starts to happen to them when they go to middle school and for the rest of their lives, they get a case of the gimmies. And none of us ever outgrow the gimmies. We take them with us through the years. Even at my stage of life, you've still got some gimmies going on. It's hard to be content. Let me say it another way. Not only is no one born content, contentment is not for sale. Sometimes I wish you could just save up my money and get some contentment. Yeah, good. It's not for sale. It can't be purchased. Let me tell you something else. Contentment is not a gift. Contentment is learned through personal experience, and it takes time and willingness to develop. It takes time and willingness to develop. And sometimes when people see contentment, where they're encouraged to feel contented, they say to themselves that they're being weak rather than strong. And what an inversion that is. Please know this. The word content does not mean I do not care about what happens. The word content does not mean que sera, sera, what will be, will be. Contentment is not indifference. Contentment is not laziness. Contentment is not lack of ambition. It doesn't mean to take no action to improve your situation. It means doing what you are able by placing your trust in the goodness of God. Do that again. Contentment means doing what you are able by placing your trust in the goodness of God. It's been said that some people, even Christian people, are thermometers and other people are thermostats. Now, Dominic knows much more about this than I do, and I know Jim does and a few other people who work in this world, but let me explain to you what I'm talking about. Thermostats simply register the temperature around them. If there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of pressure, and you're a thermostat, guess what you do? All of a sudden, you start registering tension and irritability. If it's stormy, you start registering worry and fear. If it's calm and quiet and comfortable, you measure relaxation and peacefulness. Those are thermostats. Excuse me, those are not thermostats, those are thermometers. Others are thermostats. Instead of simply registering the environment, they regulate it. Because they are mature believers, they purposely strive to keep the circumstances from life determining who they are and how they respond. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying they become change agents. They become salt and like, just like Jesus talked about. And when they make that Choice. It makes a difference not just in their world, but in the world at large. Now think with me about what's going on out there and whether you really want what's going on out there to be happening in here. The world does not shout and whisper, be content. Every time you turn around, it's like you deserve this and you deserve that. Very scary. It shouts and, what's the world shout and whisper? Be discontent. Over and over again, it says to us, get this or do that. And if you don't get this or do that, it encourages us to be what? A malcontent. Never satisfied, always complaining, and seeing a gray twilight in every single lining that there is. Now think with me. How is the counsel of the world working? How's the counsel of the world working? People today have more than what people ever had before. Most of us in this room live better than kings did not long ago, but are we really living a better life? 
Are we more satisfied? Are we more at peace? Are we more content? Content. Sadly, more often than not, the answer is no. But that doesn't have to be the answer. Like the Apostle Paul, we can learn to be content. But there's a clause. If we're willing. Yes, you can be content. If you're willing. Well, what was the secret? Remember Paul said the word secret. What was the secret that he learned? Look at verse 13. I can do everything through him who says Jesus. I can do everything through Jesus who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. Most of us have heard it for years. Most of us have quoted it for years. It's a very popular verse to see on posters and t-shirts and coffee cups. But what do we know about this particular verse? Lots of times it's misunderstood or misapplied. Lots of times it's taken out of context. So let's make sure we look very carefully at what this verse actually says and make sure that we look at this verse and see what it actually means. When Paul said, I can do everything through him who gives me strength, he wasn't saying, I can do everything that I want. That's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying you can accomplish all your goals. He wasn't saying you can fulfill all of your dreams. He wasn't saying that all the days ahead will be nothing but miles and miles of smiles and smiles. That is not what he's talking about. Paul wasn't saying through the strength of Christ, we can all sing like Mark Huff. If I could sing like Mark Huff, you wouldn't be hearing me speak my sermons. I'd be singing my sermons all the time. That's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying through the strength of Christ that we can all play golf as well as Al and Zorro or Jim Kaiser. He wasn't saying that through the strength of Christ we all have the power to be able to lift up heavy objects like Tony can lift up, like Robbie Yates can lift up, like Dominic and his son can lift up. He wasn't saying that through the power of Christ we can all run like Dan Hartman. I saw him one day when I was coming out of church late and you left here. I don't see where you are right now, but I know I saw you earlier. There he is. And he was running home. And he was running home faster than I was driving my car. And I thought, who is that? It was Dan Norman. He wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying that I could calculate like Michael Capito. Because I can't calculate like Michael Capito. He's smarter than I am. I'm just older than he is. It's the only thing that evens it out at all. He wasn't saying that through the strength of Christ, we can buy houses we can't afford. But the houses buy you more than you buy the house. He wasn't saying you don't ever have to study before you take the test. You don't have to study at all. Because of the strength of Christ, you'll pass without studying at all. He wasn't saying you'll never get sick. He wasn't saying you'll never be hurt. He was never saying you won't ever have a difficult day. He wasn't saying that circumstances aren't going to be poor sometimes. And he certainly wasn't saying you won't face challenges. He wasn't saying Christ will do everything for us and we have no responsibility at all. So what did Paul mean when he wrote these words we hear all the time? What did Paul mean when he wrote words people write on the board, people put on a sign, people put on a t-shirt, a hat, or whatever else? What was he saying? He was saying when he said the words, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. What's the word everything referring to? It's referring to everything he's been discussing so far in this particular passage. And as I read it, I thought, how can we explain it a little bit better? So I looked at various translations, but there was one that just showed it so, so strongly I wanted to share it with you. It's from the Living Bible, and I know the Living Bible is not a translation, but it's certainly helpful, helpful in this. It sheds some light on what the Apostle meant. Listen to how the Living Bible describes this verse 4, 13. It says, I can do everything God asks me to do with the help of Christ who gives me the strength and the power. Wow, what a difference. Therefore, no matter what our circumstances, and whatever they may be, whatever the trials we may face, no matter how difficult the road ahead, God offers us his strength. He doesn't offer us his strength so we can do anything we want. He offers us his strength so we can be and do what God calls us to be and do and know this. 
through the power of Jesus Christ, we can learn to be content. Learn to be content. We can have settled confidence in the goodness of God, even when we face things we do not understand. Let me take it a step further. Even when we face things we don't even want to understand and we wish we didn't even know existed. So here's the question. How do we transfer those truths into our lives? Everything we've talked about so far is true. How do we transfer those truths into our lives? How do we move on towards spiritual maturity? How do we stay on this particular path? Well, let me give you a suggestion. Let me say it to you very emphatically. Carefully and prayerfully look into your life and see what is holding you back from being stable and balanced. Look into your life. Look into your heart. Look into your mind. Look into your soul and see what is holding you back. What is holding you back? from staying up instead of going up and down? What is holding you back from staying in instead of going in and out? What is holding you back from thinking, speaking, and acting like Jesus Christ? What is keeping you back from your fullness in Christ? What is holding you back from being spiritually mature? And when you discover the answer, and you ask with earnestness, believe me, you'll share with the answer, Make a decision that no one can make for you other than yourself. And let me tell you what it is. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. When you find something that you're hanging on to tightly and it's doing you no good, let it go. Well, what does it mean to let it go? Well, the Bible answers that question. It tells us to confess it. What does that mean? I mean, say the same thing about it that God does. After we confess it, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to cast all of our cares on Him. And when you do that, He directs our path. Cast it, and don't pour it back in. But don't stop there. You repent of whatever it is. You're going to go a different direction. You're not going to keep on letting it happen over and over and over again. And then, guess what? We ask the Lord to set you free. And when He sets you free, you're free indeed. And what does that mean? It means you're walking in newness of life. Pure biblical truth. You can't do that for yourself. But you can do that through the power of God. But it has to be a choice you make to let God give His strength through you. And take the, and take the heart. The admonition the Apostle Paul gave the young pastor Timothy. I want you to see that. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Remember everything Paul has gone through. Remember Timothy's on the other end of the stage. He's just learning what it means to be a pastor. And he's hearing some words I think he thought about the rest of his life. 1 Timothy 6, 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Those words, the longer I live, the more true I know that is. Godliness with contentment is great gain. How can godliness with contentment be a great gain? Well, we answer that question. It makes us more alive. And guess what else? When we have godliness and contentment, it makes it us more lovable. Godliness and contentment is great gain. What does that mean? It yields wisdom. Who couldn't use a little more wisdom in this world? Godliness and contentment. What else does it give birth to? It gives birth to strength. It gives birth to appreciation. It gives birth to peace. Now think about the opposite. You don't have godliness and contentment. What do you have in your life? Filled with foolishness, weakness, pride, and heartache. Who wouldn't rather have wisdom than foolishness? Who wouldn't rather have strength than weakness? Who wouldn't rather have appreciation than pride, who wouldn't rather have lose heartache and gain joy. Never forget that spiritual maturity and contentment don't just happen on their own. God invites us to experience these blessings, but know this, He does not impose those things on us at all. Spiritual maturity and contentment are blessings. They're great blessings. And they really are available. 
but they are a matter of choice. Your choice. My choice. We live in a world where so many times we hear people go, me, 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 me. I, 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 I. And when I hear that, I just want to go, I, 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 I. Because it's just not good. It's just not good. So pray. Ponder. And act. Choose. And choose carefully. Become a person of maturity and contentment. Be consistent. Be reliable. Be dedicated. You can, yes, you can really know spiritual maturity and true contentment through the power of Christ. But it is a matter of choice. Your choice. Yes, we, you and me, we really can know spiritual maturity and true contentment. What's that worth in this world? Through the power of Christ. But it is a matter of choice. As we go over, <coughs> our challenge is not with aging. Oh, we say it all the time to each other. Biggest discussion, like who doctor do you see this week with this trip? You know? That's not our biggest problem. It's maturity, especially spiritual maturity. That's true throughout our lives. Want to have the best life here on this earth? Want to be a little bit more prepared for heaven? Want to hear God say, Well done? Godliness and contentment. They're a great game. They'll make you more effective. They'll make you more loving. Make more lovable. And you'll get blessings beyond what you could ever imagine. The flesh will fight you on this battle to the day you die. But the spirit is stronger than the flesh. But there's a qualifier. There's a qualifier. You have to make that choice. And how do you know you really going to make that choice? I'll tell you how. You get a few people in your life and you say, you know what? I need to talk to you. I need you to hold me accountable on some things. There's some things in my life are difficult for me to be able to overcome. So I need you to stand with me too. I do that all the time. I do that a lot. And I'm grateful for it. These verses were going on for years. Are we truly taking them to heart? God, this contentment is a great game. You really can have contentment. Not perfect perfection, but contentment. But there's a choice. And the person who makes that choice, the only person who can make that choice, is you. So let me encourage you. Do that. And then tell me next week if it's helped you. Do that. And tell me on your birthday. If it's been helpful. Do that. And then if I live 10 more years, let's talk about whether you were grateful for that. Do that. And someday when we're up in heaven walking out on the streets of gold, I say, hey, what'd you think about that? And I have a feeling you're going to say, but I made that choice. Godliness and contentment. Great thing. You can do all things through Christ. Amen. Everything he wants you to be and do can take place. But you have to make the choice to let it happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we live in a world where we are dying in the all time. We live in a world where people think they deserve this, that, and the other thing. We live in a world where there's humility that's demonstrated. People think that they're weak or that they're afraid or they're overwhelmed. Father, we pray, Lord, that we'd have eyes that do see, we have ears that hear. We pray that we'd have a heart that understands. We read verses about, I can do all things through Christ, and we see how people even twist those up, and we know that we have a tendency toward that ourselves. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would spend some time with you, even right now. 
Lord, teach me if I'm really contented and if I really want it. Lord, teach me if I really want to grow and have desires that aren't human in my nature. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would remember what we've talked about. We've only looked at three verses today. These verses can be transformational. Father, help us to know you have all power. Help us to know you'll share that power with us if we make the choice to yield to you. For we pray in Jesus' name.